Wells Fargo is a huge organization, so uh, we're going to talk about what we do in the area that we're in, which is the business banking group. That's different than the retail side, which is the branches and has a lot of the customer service and customer facing day to day needs. Um, there? No, I think you hit that well. We're just really excited to be here with you. And just a couple things. We don't want this necessarily to be a traditional lecture. If you have any questions throughout, please feel free to raise your hands or send something online. We'd love to answer any questions that you have throughout our presentation. Go ahead. Sorry, which one are you using, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Michael. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Sure. Just say M. If no one views, you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, good to, it's good to keep it straight. Yeah. So Mike is great and Marshall. So. so. Uh, yeah, so we'll just kind of go from, from there. So uh, a little bit about myself, and I think you covered most of it. I've been with the bank for 12 years. I uh, started out as a personal banker in the, in the branches and uh, did a lot of customer face-to-face -face interaction, helping with customer service needs and um, really, really getting to know the community that way. After transitioning from the personal banker role, I went into a business specialist position where I primarily focused on surrounding businesses that surrounded the, the branches that I covered. And it was, that was a fun experience. I know that you had a similar experience, but right. just getting to know all of, the, all of the businesses that were in the community right next to us really was a fun mm -hmm. opportunity to get to know small businesses, their owners, and, and when you meet with, with, uh, with business owners, they are passionate about what they do. So that was fantastic. Uh, since 2008, I've been in the business banking group, and have uh, have had have, I've had the opportunity to work in Park City for the business banking group as well as in Salt Lake, which is where we both currently work from. That's awesome. And, and similar to Mike, I, I kind of started out on the retail side of things as a teller about five years ago. I spent about two and a half years on that side, doing a very similar role in helping our customers with customer service as well as making the transition as a business specialist. My favorite part about that job was actually being able to get out of the bank and go visit the businesses themselves and take tours and see what these people have created and made it profitable. That was my favorite part, to just see that in action and to also be that support to help them out that way. Um, and then a couple years after that, um, I transitioned into the Salt Lake Business Banking Group and then Mike and I are actually on the same team. Here locally. Yep. So, so uh, we're, well, we kind of jumped a little bit ahead, but we're planning on talking about uh, still what we do, past experiences, and then also some tips for success. And then we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. So what we do, we each manage a portfolio of, of clients. And I think it's really nice to have the opportunity to do this with Marshall because we both manage a very different book of business. I have, tw I have just 25 customers that I manage in my portfolio. And most of it is real estate investment, so commercial properties, uh, real it could be multifamily, office buildings, uh, construction projects, um, and, and that's, I would say that's about 90% of what, what my business entails. Awesome. And, and Mike's really the guru for real estate in our office, and it's great to have him and his expertise there. I mainly focus on operating credit, so that's going to be like coming into a business and assessing what kind of working capital do you need to keep your doors open every day? What kinds of line of credit do you need in place? What kind of loans do you need for your equipment, whether it's your trucks, your forklifts, bulldozer, whatever it is, to keep your business in operation, as well as helping manage that cash flow. Can they collect quick enough to make the payments that they need to do? And so I manage about 60 clients that way. Yeah, and I, I think one of, the, one of the aspects that we both focus on is understanding the business understanding it inside and out that really helps us deliver the best message to our customers and helps us assess their needs and really helps us have a have a successful working relationship it also gives us the opportunity to develop a, a deeper personal relationship with our customers and i think that has really helped uh, both of us in our in our business well, I, I agree with you 100 on that one mike perfect so um, kind of along that way, there's a few things that we manage as bankers, as we kind of talked about. First one is a relationship. Very much so we're the primary contact for our customers. So if they have fraud, if they have any issues whatsoever, we're the first dial on the phone, or we come out and see the person and go through that. 
which is really important and we try to meet with them frequently just so that they see us they think of us as their needs are changing they're calling us uh, oftentimes businesses go through cycles right so they'll they'll either be really busy they'll be growing or they might be winding down the company and so it's important for us to get out there and and really understand where they are in their business cycle so we can assess what their needs are and adjust our relationship accordingly. That's perfect. And I think the easiest way to compare it is if you look at your own life. When you were a kid, it was like, what can I save up to get my candy bar on my bicycle because I want to go see my neighbor or my friend. As you get older, you're like, oh, I need a car because i got to make it to work or i got to make a school night payment or a home. Very similar way in businesses, like Mike was mentioning on that life cycle. So. That's a good point. Yeah, um, this next slide is just talks a lot about the common things that we, we see from a, a lending area, lending focus with some of our borrowers. Um, as I mentioned, I do a lot of commercial real estate, um, but we do, we do a lot of different things, and there's a pretty thorough list of, of the, the items that we cover. Um, and the nice part for us, just a quick little blurb, and I'll get done. Um, in any kind of banking industry, oftentimes you'll have specialists. So if you guys ever go into where you have that need, there's usually somebody that that's all they do. And that's who you'd want to talk to. So. Do we have a, what is the background of most people in the audience today? Do, is it, are you guys interested in business? Is it a legal field? It's a mix of majors. A mix, yeah, mix of majors. That's, that's great. And I think what, what we've seen that Wells Fargo, and this is kind of maybe a little off topic, but because Wells Fargo is so big, there's a lot of different avenues that can that you can go into that will fit your background. And I think that's been fun to be a part of it. Right, I mean, through my career at least. Weekly, you're almost we're on the phone with our, like, our attorneys or our lawyers or our software developers. I mean, there's so many different avenues in one kind of that way. Um, I apologize, I skipped one thing on the last slide, I'll just touch it real quickly. On the relationship management piece of it, one of our major roles is how do we add value to this client? Because most often times when you think of a bank, it's where am I gonna put my cash? And then are they gonna give me money for a loan, right? There's not too many more complex needs than that. And really the value comes in with our job is, like Mike was mentioning a little bit, is we'll come in with their financials and analyze them with them and kind of help them understand the trends of their business and help them kind of see where they're going, what the needs are that way, and also offer support through different types of products. That's mostly what my job entails on the operating you know, lending side of it. So. And I think it's a critical, critical piece in every job that we have, so I agree with you, especially with the working in the branches, you are doing so much customer interface and, and it's nice to be able to be a sounding board and also give that higher level of value to those customers. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> that's great, thanks. So another component of our job is risk management. And that, a big part of that is understanding the risks in a business when we're financing one of their needs. And that could be anything um, from a financial performance issue or a change in the industry, maybe uh, you know, people are no longer buy buying pumpkins because it's the end of the season. So you know, that's gonna become more of a difficult thing to finance. Part of it is on our existing relationships, we complete annual reviews every 12 months for each one of our relationships. And that's to give us an opportunity to get in front of our customers, assess their financial position over the last year, and, uh, and then along with that, on most of our lending needs, we do, we do establish covenants. And those covenants kind of give us an opportunity to assess where a business stands over the prior year and makes it, makes it so we can uh, decide how the relationship's going from a financial perspective. That might include covenants for a net worth of a company or we were talking about some of the ratios that we use to measure uh, how successful businesses being, and we'll run that analysis and kind of go from there. Right, and um, kind of along that point, we put a fun little picture here for you, kind of this risk, because like how much is that cash worth to really get, get crushed by the piano? But really, 
you have the five C's of credit. I won't go into detail on that one for you because I hope you don't fall asleep during this. But one of the main things that we will look at first is the character of the person we lend to. Because it's not businesses that repay loans, it's people. And so a lot of times when we are meeting with clients, um, they're assessing us, but we're also assessing them up. Is this somebody that has a proven track record of paying their bills on time, as well as are they being transparent in what they give us? Unfortunately, in our world, we see sometimes people will put together um, financials that are not accurate or not true. And so that's kind of our job to assess, hey, what's the character of the individual we're doing business with? I think that's a good point. And along with that, something we consider is our primary source of repayment. We typically, when we underwrite, we underwrite the three items. A primary source of repayment, which is typically the cash flow from the business, does it have enough cash flow to service the amount of debt that they have? The second thing we look at is typically the support of the individuals that are sponsoring or guaranteeing the loan. They're, they're promising to repay the bank. And then the third thing that we're looking at is our tertiary source of repayment. And that really comes down to the collateral that our loan is secured by. And we consider all of those things, but I think to Marshall's point, and it's an important point, is the character of the individual is the most important. And then we kind of go through those steps and do some analysis to determine whether or not it's a credit that we can move forward with. Oh, that's great. And I think to that point, <clears throat> if you want to compare that to your own life a little bit, you say, okay, if I'm going to get this loan for this home, what happens if I lose my job tomorrow, right? What, is, what happens if I don't have any cash in my bank account and my car breaks down next week, right? How can I support that? And so a large part of that analysis for us is to what we call stress testing. And so we'll stress test the business saying, hey, can it withstand some normal life instances that'll come into play on that business? And so. So this next slide is uh, talking about common challenges that we see in lending. Uh, Marshall touched base on the poor financial reporting and I think that uh, some of that is just business owners can be busy and so having them sit down and put together a financial package can be difficult and sometimes uh, it might be a smaller business so they don't have all the resources to, to get everything done the way it should be done. That's a challenge that we face. And in that, I think timing is a critical factor. Um, so I want you guys to think for a second, can you sell too much? Right, yeah. that's something I like to ask the business owners. And the reason they, they usually look at me going, what do you mean? I want to grow my sales double this year. I want to triple it. Oftentimes what we find when they don't do their financial reporting quick enough, they're not watching the expense or the cost to get that next dollar in revenue. And so oftentimes, unfortunately, when I see a company growing so fast, they can grow themselves right out of business because what they're selling, they're not making enough to support that sale. And so that's a really key thing to, to watch for. It's one of the thing, key components that we always look at is those margins in between the, the sales and the cost to sell. So. Anyways, uh, another thing is that we see uh, is taking too much in distributions. So we'll see really, really profitable companies. They make a lot of money, and they take all of the money from the company and distribute it to the owners for their lifestyle. And that can become a challenge because when we go to underwrite the business, all of a sudden a company that looks really profitable on paper has no, there's no net worth because they've moved all of that out of the company. So that, again, this goes back to a little bit what we were talking about with covenants, is we have an opportunity to have some of these covenants in place on our loans so that every year we can test and make sure that it's still in compliance. And if it's not in compliance, it's, it's a good opportunity for us to sit down with our borrowers, have that conversation about you know, what happened last year compared to what, where those numbers need to be. And I think it's an important point, and we put on the very bottom kind of lack of communication, and, and to that, sometimes um, we'll, we'll get a, a package from a client saying, hey, my line of credit's due next week, can we renew it? And they've known all year that they've had some issues that year. And it's like, well, you've you got to give me more than a week to work through that and help you out that way. And so I think that's a big thing is we really want to be a partner 
with their businesses. And that would be my big application if anybody wants to be in business, is to find partners to surround yourself with that you can communicate effectively with. And then that way, if you give each other enough time, you can work through issues and be a lot more successful that way. So I think that's, I think that's a really good point. We don't always have rosy conversations with our customers, but they're always productive. They're always good, and I think it really does develop the relationship with them. So this is a business development. That's a fun part of the business, and, and obviously managing relationships and deepening the existing relationships we have is a lot of fun. But I think both Marshall and I, with our experience as business specialists, working with smaller companies and getting out and getting to know them, this piece is really critical to what we both do. And I think it makes our <coughs> job a lot of fun. And it's getting out, networking with people, uh, coming to events like this. I think that, you know, this is a great opportunity to come and speak with you guys. And then uh, just networking with uh, attorneys and accountants, brokers. And there, there's so many opportunities out there um, to work with people. And you never know who you're going to meet when you're there. Um, for example, I was helping out at Salvation Army a couple weeks ago, and uh, we're helping him put together some financial education for people to help come out of poverty. And I met a couple business owners that that was their passion, was the Salvation Army. And they were excited that we cared as much as a bank to come out and do it, and that was a good lead-in for me to help them out on the business side. So you never know, I think the best part on this, who you're going to meet and where. And so I, I think kind of keeping um, an idea of keeping yourself best presented wherever you're at um, is a good idea because you never know what that will turn into for you later. I think that's right. So it's, uh, what you're talking about sounds like um, your question is related to commercial real estate and how decisions are made on, on maybe financing, yeah. on, on financing when it's maybe close to the line of yeah, something yeah. that we wouldn't do. Yeah. So I think what you're talking about are risks and mitigants, right? So we have, we'll have risks. We might have that the, if this is an investor property where there isn't a lot of uh, margin in the profits to service the debt that's outstanding, we need to be able to mitigate that. And, and what I've discovered in my career is that it's, underwriting is more of an art form than it is just true math. And so to your point, we do have the ability to go and have those conversations with the people that we need to seek approval from. And so uh, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is really knowing that customer and knowing their business cycle. You know, if we're looking at an owner-occupied building and our snapshot in time is during a slow season, let's say we're in Park City and it's, you know, summertime, it's not going to look as strong as if it's winter and, you know, the apartment complex is fully leased up with with renters so we do have uh, I, I would say significant amount of time and, and ability to go and speak to our approvers and kind of make the case and this all happens in a document that we write up and present to a to a committee it, kind of the way to look at it is the bankers really is the advocate and that one working with the customer saying hey can we get comfortable with this type of a deal and then we'll sign off on it and then send it to an approver for review that way. Um, and another example for him is sometimes on commercial real estate on an owner-occupied, they won't pay as much rent as the guy next door because like, I own the building, I don't want to pay market rates. And so that's sometimes why the rent is low. And just a follow-up, what are your guys' metrics for job performance? Is it number of you know, money secured for clients or what do you guys, how do you guys know how do your bosses know that when you're doing a good job? Is it purely client satisfaction or is it, you know, a number one? So we do have the client satisfaction goal and, um, you know, we do have a department that calls all of our clients in our portfolio uh, throughout the year to check in and see how, if they know who their banker is, right? That's pretty important in, in what we do. So that's an aspect of it. Uh, getting in front of our customers so scheduling meetings, scheduling appointments, that's also a component. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no, there's no like certain set requirement to hit some number, some threshold. Okay. It's, uh, it's growing your portfolio, growing your biz book of business year over year is kind of what our goal is.
in, in the hope of the boss is when you do a write up that they don't you don't have to go back and forth five or ten times on it that they can read through it. Hey, this makes sense. I agree with it. You come out, and so that's kind of how you can progress in that way is your level of understanding of the project or the loan you're working on, and the amount of reviews that are required afterwards. And and some of these write ups can be sixty or seventy pages long, and so that's always fun <laughs> making changes <laughs> to thirty pages of writing. But uh, yeah, so those are great questions. So it's not as if you're given a target to meet. No. No there's, there's no target. Okay. There's no set target for us to achieve. So, good question. Retention. Retention is a big part of what we do. And that's, again, I think that goes back to harvesting the re relationship, making sure that our customers know who we are <coughs> and call us when they have a need. Uh, I like to think what we do is a big part of it is being a quarterback for the relationship. So, if even if it's not something we do, I hope that they're giving me a call and I can get them in touch with the right people. Thank you. Go ahead. So just adding into that, what is what is your motivation personally to um, to continue that retention, to continue you know having those numbers up? I mean, is it like a commission base, a, a salary base? You know, yeah, we're because we're if you're not necessarily regulated, what's to stop you from just kind of yeah being there? Yeah, so we're, sal we're salary based. Uh, a big focus for me is keeping a roof over my head. <laughs> you know, so that, that's a big part of what drives me, you know, being able to feed my family. Uh, but I also really enjoy what I do. I like getting out and meeting with businesses. I think that it is one of the most fun things you can do is get to know businesses in our community, what they do, why they do what they do. Um, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's my phone. That's kind of my desire. And, and I love being able to help a business succeed. Like, it's really fun when you get a new project that you get to work on. You got the 20 entities on your desk that you have to review and analyze and get something done because the guy next door doesn't have the time or desire to do it. And I think that's really fun where you can help them structure to help their business do better. So that's one of my favorite parts of the job. And so that's what drives me up to go and find more people to help out with. Is I love the challenge of figuring out how to get something to work. Yeah, so I guess, I guess for me, some of my past experiences in my career have been uh, when I start in a new role, sometimes I go into it thinking I should already know what I'm doing and I don't want to look like I'm incompetent. So I go in and, and act like, all right, you know, I'm going to fake it till I make it. But sometimes, and I do think that there's a place for that, but sometimes it's okay to raise your hand, ask questions. And I think what I've noticed in the jobs that I've had, when I get into a new position, the first few months, that's the best time to just get in there, ask questions, get all the information you possibly can. So that way, a year from then, when you should know your job, you know it. And, it's, and you don't feel like you're trying to play catch up. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I think there's no wasted job, in all honesty. If you, whatever experience that you're in, if you do your best that you can on that, it's going to help you so much on the next one. Um, before I, I went into banking, I actually wanted to be an engineer, and I worked for the state for three years doing flood analysis for them. And it was so tedious, it drove me crazy, because I sat in front of my computer all day making models and spreadsheets and running numbers, but I really learned how to technically write well. Uh, from that experience. And that really helped me today when we're writing your 60 or 70 page basically essay, if this is why we should do this loan, I could do it a lot better. And so I, I really could emphasize to you, whatever job you have, even if you may not like it, there is always something you can learn at it and excel that's going to help you later on that you may not realize. So I totally agree. I think every job I've had at Wells Fargo has been a building block for the next one. So overcoming challenges. Um, my experience kind of with this has been when I, when I came out of college in 2005, I thought, all right, I've got my degree, I'm ready to go run this company, uh, and sign me up. And that just was not the reality. And instead, you know, I, I found an entry level position at, at Wells Fargo and have worked the last 12 years 
developing my skill set and and just to your point a few minutes ago is learning what I could on that particular job to use it for the next one and the one after that. So, awesome. uh, for me, I didn't know what I wanted to do at first, and I, and I think I made the mistake of when I got to school it was all right. What is the least expensive or least time frame to get this degree done, and I want to get out of here. And so I started in engineering, and I was cranking through it. And after three years, I finally figured out this is not what I like to do. But I didn't do anything else. I didn't try all these other classes in the very beginning to try and figure out what my personality match was, what is it that I love to do, and then do the job shadow. And so I think is a challenge sometimes as students is having that resource and time to do it. And so I'd emphasize taking as much as you can to try those atmospheres early on, and so you can have those experiences to really Go ahead. Um, on the overinflated expectations, what's your guys' best tip for kind of managing that? Like if a customer comes to you and has just way unrealistic expectations, what are some ways that you kind of say, all right, hold on, let's shift towards more reality? For me, I think what I like to do is sit down with that customer and just look at their financials, have a discussion about it. We can run some ratios to kind of give them some insight to, to where they sit, what we, we can give them a foundation for what we're looking at on, um, like for minimum underwriting standards. And that kind of helps direct the conversation. But a lot of it uh, is coaching, right? I mean, so if, the, if they, if ultimately their lofty dream is their lofty dream, we don't want to you know, say that's not a reality. We want to coach around how to get to that point and some things that we can see in their financials that would help us, you know, be able to underwrite that request in the future. And I think to that point, one thing my wife taught me very early on, I have to throw her in a little bit, but is not to blame the client for anything that's going wrong with the business. Not say, well, because you did this, this happened. It's, hey, in this situation, this limits me here. You know, because then it's not a defensive with a client. Because uh, when you have those coaching moments, like Mike talked about, we'll see oftentimes, hey, we want to help you. I can't right now as a banking institution, but here's some things that I see that you can work on to where you could qualify for a loan from me. And then we'll see them a year or two later where we can do the loan. Whereas up front, to your point, if we didn't handle that correctly, they'd probably just be somewhere else we'd never see them again. Just so I understand that correctly, the whole point in coaching them is that you don't want them to turn away because you're still a valid business and you're trying to maintain a consumer base, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason why you coach is to keep people in that loop where it's like, yeah, you're not at the point where you need to be right now, but come back to us in the future when you are so we can make you a partner or we can clean money off of you. That's, that's the point, right? So so I, I think what you're asking is, when we have that coaching conversation, we're saying this is not something that we can finance right now, but we, you know, if you hit some of these benchmarks, we could look at this again in the future. What we try to do is find alternative solutions. So that might be, let's say it's a $5 million request for a line of credit or something. That might be a $1 million line of credit the first year. And then we sit back down with them in a year and reevaluate their financial performance and have those discussions. Mm -hmm. Does that address what you're how asking? how detrimental is it when a business like fails under like even though like damage mitigation was there like what happens on your end when like when a business fails? Well, a lot of times if if there's let's say covenants are not being met or they're not able to continue making loan payments, we have we do have a workout team that works with them to either make payments or find another solution that could be charging off the loan. Mm -hmm. So, and usually you just take it as collateral. Which so is, which is, bold. yeah, it depends on what you're, on, exactly, it depends on what the collateral is, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's equipment that's securing a loan, you, you might take that equipment. Some loans are unsecured, so you wouldn't have collateral to rely on. And, and to your point, oftentimes you don't necessarily see a business also on one day it's successful, and the next day it, it doesn't well, work no, at all. No, that's because you have... Right, like <laughs> you must meet this requirement to even like partner with us. So, yeah, right. It's not a usual thing, and it doesn't happen a lot. But there are some like very extreme cases where like something really bad happened to the business, and well, now they're under. 
right? And, and to that point, I had an example a couple years ago. I had a client. He he had one of his drivers sue him mm -hmm. for four million bucks, and he lost. And his insurance didn't cover it. And so you imagine anybody taking a four million dollar hit to their bottom line is going to hurt. And so we knew, hey, your business is successful, and we worked with them for the last couple of years, and now we're okay, and we're actively lending and helping them out again. And so. I think to your point is we want to keep them as long as we can to help them, but there are things in play if it's a one-time thing we can help them through. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, you, well, to your point, I don't think that's something that's very common because of the the initial underwriting that we complete, and then the and then the ongoing conversations that we have, uh, you know, to uncover some of those things that might need to be addressed. I think in, in my time at Wells Fargo, I think I've had one one borrower that has not been able to repay their loan. Hmm. So, 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 so with that, you don't. I, I'm assuming Wells Fargo doesn't do a lot of you know venture venture capitalist type funding of funding projects that have really big potential, but maybe lots more risk. You know, what is the line there? Do you do you guys only grant to, or do you guys only loan? To businesses that you know have a have a positive cash flow, or do you guys actually seek out businesses to get in with them early at beginning, you know, infancy stages and growing with them as they go? Yeah. Big? What I'd say that uh, Marshall and I focus on is primarily business established businesses that have some historical track record, um, but. Wells Fargo is really large, so there's definitely some departments that look at, you know, if it might be small business, it might be the SBA, the small business administration loans, it might be uh, technology loans. There's definitely some startup um, departments that work with those types of businesses that are just getting off the ground. I was even learning last week, you even have a venture capital department on some of the really big ideas that come out. And so um, I think to your point on the question was what types of loans do we go after or history of companies. Um, I think part of it is finding the right person to help you out in that situation. If you're a startup, hey, maybe it's an SBA or technology or something to fill that area. Uh, but to my, Mike and I, we mostly deal with a proven track record type style of their business. So, yep. this is, which, one of it, which one of you is the, really likes to travel? Yeah. I do. So we have had a lot of speakers who kind of center their careers around what they like to do in their spare time. Okay. So how do you make time to do what it is you like to do when you're working? Not to just totally second. No, you're work, good. Um, <laughs> like, I, I think that comes in planning and in, in anything. And so for us, there's two times a year is extremely busy. And that's when tax returns come available. So that's okay. either April, May. Or October, November, and so it's very hard to take vacation in those times of year. But in other times, it might be slower. So if I can get most of my work done, I can take a week or two off and go travel or go take time. And so really, it's just that planning. And the nice part about our current job is there's a lot of flexibility, as long as we're meeting the needs of our clients and doing what we're asked to do to get time off. Because I'm not necessarily having to man store hours on a branch and saying, "Oh, hey, we only have three people. You have to stay today." Was that an important decision for you in taking this job that you had that flexibility so that you could do something that was important to you in life? Absolutely. And I, I really like the fact that during the day, if I need to go for a couple hours, I can. So, like, if I have a, I don't have any kids yet, one on the way, I'm excited. But when they have a game or I need to take to a doctor or something, I can physically step out and not have that hurt my company or my clients and then come back and work later. I can work from home on the weekends if I need to. There's a lot of flexibility that way. That makes it very nice. And I think that's a good point. I do have two young right. children. So I have a, a five-year-old and then one and a half-year-old. Nice. And so they require a lot of attention and sometimes they're sick because they go to daycare and there's a lot of germs being passed back and forth. Right. But it, it, the job is really nice because it does give me an opportunity to be flexible with my time and it does offer that work-life balance that is most important to me, so. And what about hobbies for you? Is this, was that something that also was yeah. important to you in taking it? Yeah, so I grew up in Utah, so for me, uh, the mountains are oh, my right. biggest hobby. Here. 
that's my biggest hobby. So we, we spend a lot of weekends up at Solitude. Um, it's perfect for the perfect for the little ones, and they uh, it's a good mountain for that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Good question. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm actually looking at getting into real estate investing, mm -hmm. but I have no idea where to start, and I understand that right now it's definitely like a seller's market. Um, so my first question is, is now even a good time to look at real estate? And then the second question is, you know, where do you, where do you start with that kind of stuff? I'm going to lean on you on that one. Yeah, so, I, so you're right. It's a, it's a really hot market for sellers, and I'm not sure if you're lo talking about residential or business or commercial. Well, yeah, that's part of my question is, is, is it better to, you know, buy a place and rent it out? Is it better to flip houses? What's, what's the best route? Yeah, so I've had borrowers that, and primarily I'd say my borrowers are investors in office, warehouse, uh, distribution centers, multifamily, uh, and, and there's a, definitely a market for them to sell right now. Uh, but they have to redeploy any of those profits so it's not taxed. You know, at the same level um, that it would be otherwise if it's not redeployed. Um, so, I guess my advice would be: um, have if you know anyone that does real estate investment, talk to them. If you're interested, I'm happy to share some other things that we look at. Um, uh, we have business cards. I'm happy to address like questions you have about down payment, about uh, yeah. structure, about loan to values um, yeah and there's also a lot of uh, resources available through some of the real estate agents some of the larger ones like um, let's see who CRE is a, is a good one and they put out re annual reports quarterly re reports that talk about the investor real estate market what's happening in certain segments so when we're doing our industry analysis on what we're looking at, we a lot a lot of times will go look at some of those reports and kind of see details on, on specific industries. But to Mike's point, I don't think you can ask enough questions on any business you go into, um, especially in the veterans, um, just because you can learn those tips and tricks that they usually had to learn the hard way up front that cost them money or prevented them from doing it, that can save you a lot of time and energy there. Perfect. And, and so just a couple things um, as far as a few things that helped us get where we wanted to go that we felt like we'd like to share um, into your question earlier. Uh, one thing I'd really like to emphasize is how do I add value? A lot of things that I, I see a lot, a lot of times now is people is how much can I get from somebody else? What can I take from you? Whereas if you can kind of flip that thinking into how can I add value to the situation? How can I add value to my boss or to my job or to my school or to this relationship? It creates a whole other dynamic to where your, your bosses or the people around you go, this person is dedicated and I need them. I cannot afford to lose them. And, it, and for me, that has been a big help in progressing in my career as well as also in finding other opportunities as well as getting referrals from clients. A lot of my clients, so after I sit down with them through reviews and helping them out successfully, like, hey, my neighbor, you need to meet them because they need this. And so that would be one thing I would very highly recommend is whenever you do something, how can I add value to this? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, for me, I think being open to change has been important in my career because things don't ever remain the same. We all get in the routine and we want things to just be the way that we feel comfortable. But I think what has m helped me develop myself for my career has been to be open to change and realize that you're going to take get some good takeaways from all of those changes and, uh, and having some flexibility in what you do and, and even where you're located. You know, I grew up in Salt Lake and uh, for me, the opportunity to join the business banking group, which is what I knew I wanted to do, was to start out in Park City. So not super convenient to where I live. So every day I'd drive up, when it'd be winter, and sometimes it'd take me two or three hours to get home. But it was worth doing that for you know a couple of years to get the experience I needed. So when something opened up in Salt Lake, which is where I wanted to be, I had the experience to, to come and join the team in Salt Lake. That's awesome. Uh, one last thing, 
in the, I'll hit on this explain a little bit more. On the very bottom, there's an author named Tim Ferriss. It's called Tool of Titans. Um, he talks about how you're an average of your five closest. The five people you spend the most time with, you're typically an average of who they are. And he's, he went through and interviewed all these billionaires, successful actors, publishers, and everything like that, and said the most common thing he could find is they're that average. Um, what's funny to me is my wife's the one that read it and told me about that, and I agree with that. And so you just said, think, who do I spend the most time with is obviously who you become like. And so that could be someone you're, you're married to or live with or your coworkers and anything. And so if there's an area that you want to become better at, usually that's somebody you want to bring into that circle of friends. And I'm not advocating that on Facebook. You put five people and say, this is all I'm going to associate with today. Because you want to be kind and nice to everybody. But the five most people you spend the most time with, I think, have a huge impact on who you become. I, li I like that when you shared that with me yesterday. I was um, just kind of thinking, though, I was like, oh, better reevaluate some of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you so much. Uh, that's kind of all we had for the presentation. <laughs>